I have a question for you, and I, I want you, this is going to be a, I want you to really think through this message this morning, because I'm going to work through an argument. Rarely do people work through a full argument, but, what I, but the argument is going to ask this question. When you want to build something to last, when you want to build something to last, I mean really last, be sustainable, do you, does the design of it matter? So the question I want you to really consider, when you want to build something to last, does design matter? It depends on how important the building is that you're building. So let's say you're trying to build a house of cards with a deck of cards. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it collapses. It doesn't matter where you place the next card. It's no big deal. If it's a cardboard house box for your kid, again, who cares? about the design, do what you want, as long as they're happy. It's all that matters. But what if you're building your family's dream house that you've been saving up years to build? Or you are building a multi-million dollar industrial complex that you hope will last for hundreds of years. Design matters when the cost is extreme. Every good builder and architect will tell you that design is crucial. In fact, it's everything. But there are still mavericks out there, I'd say the independent thinkers, that believe our job is to always reimagine, ignore the rules, the traditional rules, deconstruct, and do what makes you feel good at the time. I want to introduce you to an architect by the name of Frank Gehry. He's an outside-the-box thinker. He's an avant-garde, postmodern designer who wants to throw tradition out the window. His goal is to deconstruct and start from a new creative paradigm, is his phrase. It's to design things that have never been thought up before, never dreamed about before. His philosophical credo is this, always experiment. He is, in the architectural world, a rebel. Actually, I didn't give you the full picture of his hand because it would not be appropriate in a church setting. He's reporting about some discrepancies in some of his architecture, and he doesn't take too kindly to it. He had an initial success. He was asked to um, design the Guggenheim Museum in Bilboa, Spain, and it is a, they say it's a masterpiece. Actually, high-end design and construction architects say this has made him the most important architect of our age. Credible builder. But if you talk to most professionals about this man, he is not considered highly at all. One critic said his buildings are a waste of structural resources. Another writes, he designs only for the super wealthy because the world we live in, the world we live in, 98% of what he builds and designed today is pure, and these are my words, they used another word starting with S, but they're pure cow manure, they're his designs. In a list of the top architectural failures, he, li he has at least four or five in the top ten worst design buildings ever known to man. Let me show you some. This one was one of his most recent buildings. It's called the Bio Muse Museo in Panama, in Panama City. It's an eco-discovery center, but it cost $60 million to build. Its purpose was to really attract tourism, which it has not done. One local newspaper writes, this work is badly constructed, not only from a theoretical standpoint, they try to use inventive software that was is used in airplane design, but it ends up looking like a crumpled Reynolds wrap top. Inside, it's white bread interior, boring, room by room grid. It's just held together by hairspray. It's a terrible design. And one, one uh, architect said, this last project by Gary has made him the world's worst living architect. Let me show you another one. It's called the Experience Music Project in Seattle. It cost $240 million to build this. It's used to house, house a modern music and science fiction exhibitions. It was first started by a wealthy private investor. He funded the initial, but it is now has to be maintained by taxpayers. By all accounts, it's a failure. New York Times architectural critic blames a large part of its failure in Gary's design. He says, not only does the inside feel like an unwieldy cavernous mess, but the exterior looks like something 
crawled out of the sea, rolled over, and died. <laughs> Other depictions have been equally unflattering, said it looks like open heart surgery gone awry, or a slaughtered cow, a dumped over garbage can, an airplane wreck, hemorrhoids, and something found under the couch at a college fraternity house. One architect says, a break with the past? Yeah, but a new future? God help us know. And here's his last, this is his most recent debacle. Well, actually not most recent. This happened about 10 years ago. It's a $300 million Stata Center at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. This famed university is known for training the best in physical sciences and engineering. So to try to steer away from their reputation for being, you know, a rigid scientific school, they hired Gary to build a building that reverses structural algorithms so as to create disorder. They wanted to make it look cool. Gary persuaded them that, ah, yes, deconstructivist buildings are the most visible symbols of actual deconstruction. The randomness they embody is the antithesis of nature's organized complexity. Sounds cool. The only problem in their decision to not follow traditional design concepts is that they ended up with major, not minor, major structural problems. Soon after its completion, the center's outdoor amphitheater began to crack due to drainage problems. Snow and ice, giant icicles would cascade dangerously from window boxes and other projecting roof areas, blocking emergency exits, damaging other parts of the building, and almost killing a few pedestrians. Mold grew on the center's brick exterior, and there were persistent leaks throughout the building. It ended up costing MIT more than $1.5 million just to repair the damage. They have a negligent suit out on Frank Gehry because there's still many financial issues and structural issues that are unresolved. A $300 million experimental mess. Great experiment. Costly. What if you're building something even more important than a $300 million building? Let's say you're trying to design a structure that was meant to sustain the future sustainability of mankind. Should you experiment? Should you forget about tradition and do what has never been done before? Reimagine things? Who do you sue when major damage occurs to your children and their children and their children's children because somebody messed with God's original design? Who pays the bills? Especially the design that is meant to be the one design, the one design on earth that most clearly displays the image of the immortal God. Who cleans up the mess? That's what we're going to talk about today. And I want you to open up to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read a little bit, rehashing in Genesis chapter 2. Not many verses, but profound. This is called, In His Image, part 2. And the whole purpose is one word. I want you to remember one word. Together. Together. It's the most important word of this message. Together. So let's start in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. We already read it, but we need to go back because it establishes image. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. The image of God, he created him you could say God created mankind or people in his image, and he created them male and female. Verse 28, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then we get a more, what I would say, elaborated perspective of what just happened in chapter 2 starting in verse 18. It's the same story, but it's more detailed. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper, fit. We're perfectly designed for him. Now, out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. 
The man gave names to all livestock, to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit, perfectly designed yet for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh. In the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. It's interesting in Hebrew, she shall be called Isha, taken out of Ish. There's a, supposed to be what's called a correlation between the terms that are used. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall hold fast to his wife. They shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So first, we need to review two weeks ago. We have already learned about being made in God's image, but we can't forget it. We need to remember because it's the key foundation principle to this message and also the world's hostile to what we talked about. Very hostile. We were very clear about that. Don't let this truth slip out of your fingers. So I have three that we just need to review. Number one, humanity in the sequence of creation is God's crown. Humanity, human beings are God's crown. After finishing with earth, sky, sea, mountain, bird, and cattle, he made the most glorious of creatures, mankind. We are the apple of his eye. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are priceless. Just this week, I had a person ask me, what do I do when people say things that really hurt and make me feel like I'm not worth anything? My response was simple. Never forget, God is the one who determines worth. The creator always determines the worth of his creation. God always determines worth, and to tell us how worthy we are, he sent his son to die. Point number two, man is both physical and spiritual being. This is so important because last week we talked, two weeks ago we talked about culture's low view of the body. That's kind of like a piece of putty. You can do whatever you want with it. No, body and soul both together are the image of God. Which leads to the next point, which is number three. Gender, being a man or being a woman, is a vital part of God's design. This is not a subject about feeling. It's about structural design. Remember, we're talking about design. This is the design, not feeling or what you want. It's what he intends for us so we can fulfill his will, which we'll talk about in a second. Design is for purpose. I just read a story on this point about a woman named Rebecca who was lured into lesbianism at a young age. After she graduated college, she became a Christian and she married a man. But early in her marriage, she would have frequent girl crushes. When she got the courage to discuss it with her husband, he said to her, because you are biologically a woman... You can be certain that no matter what your feelings are right now, ultimately you will be more fulfilled by a man than by another woman. Then he added, it goes both ways. Because I am biologically a man, no matter what my feelings might be, ultimately I will be more fulfilled by a woman than by another man. That's how God created us. Over time, in years of fighting her temptation, Rebecca no longer had the intense girl crushes she once had, and she came to see through her husband and her wonderful children, that God's plan is just, it's right, it's good. His design works. Nancy Piercy writes, We are most fulfilled when we accept a mental grid that recognizes the existence of an objective order created by God. In other words, she's saying design matters. We need to figure out the purpose of the design. So let's go to the next part of what we're talking about. Second part of image bearing. Not only is his image stamped on us, but it's also meant to be displayed through the covenant of marriage. 
There is, I'm just going to give a quick side note. I could talk about so much when it comes to marriage. I could talk about it. I, I could probably do 20 messages right now on marriage, but we're not focusing on that. We're going to focus on the design, the purpose of it. What's the purpose of it? That's what Genesis is going to teach us about. It's what it's going to focus on. Because I believe the clearer and more simple the focus, the more the cultural confusion surrounding will fade away. There is so much experimentation going on right now with design, so much deconstruction going on, that we no longer know what the simple purpose is anymore. The building is falling apart at the seams all around us in our society. So let's just go back to the beginning and see how it was originally designed. That's all we're going to do. First of all, I would say the definition needs to be re-explained. People don't even know what the word marriage means anymore. We've turned it into a legal and political tug-of-war piece. People want to define it in a way that will give them more rights, more tax dollars, more exemptions, rather than what the Bible has to say about it. The biblical definition of marriage is simple. It means a male and female have formed a union in which they are fused together where two persons become one. A male and a female are fused together and the two persons become one. It's like the welding of two metals. That's actually what marriage means, the combining. Where when you weld two metals, the welded part is stronger than the pieces alone. Two are one together. That is why God made the man and woman each so differently. They are different. Because together, they would display the image of God. It fits. They keep using that. Verse 18, I will make a helper fit, designed for him. They are designed to be one in mind, one in spirit, one in body. Listen to Genesis 2.24 again. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's the purpose. One. To become one. In order to accomplish this, Genesis says the man and woman must first leave and then hold fast, which is the leave and cleave. They must leave the world they came from and cleave and begin another world, a new world, a new nation. So they're creating one family out of two people. They're not creating two families. They're not saying run back home to mom when things get bad. But build a new home. Cut apron springs. A apron strings. Start over. Start new. Leaving and cleaving has been noted by most scholars as covenant language. That this is much more than just a contract or a promise. It's a it's a promise of love before a prominent promise-keeping, covenant-keeping God. The way we express this in our marriage ceremonies is till death do us part. Oneness is meant to be a permanent condition of the vow. Paul even says in Romans 7, 1 to 2, he says, the law is binding on a person as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she's released from the law. It's a binding promise. Not a contract of convenience. Exchanging services as long as both profit, but free to get out once I've had enough. It's a solemn, sacred vow before the throne of God. So, it's oneness. This bond, this covenant bond, is the key in the second part of image bearing. It displays the love of a covenant-making God. Listen to Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, Paul says. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and his love for the church. Adam uses poetry from the depth of his soul to express this new relationship. Genesis 2, 23, after he was asleep for a while, God takes a rib out of his side, then he wakes up, God says in verse 22, look at verse 22, it says the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman. And then it says he brought her to the man. So God's establishing this relationship. 
He brought her to the man, as he always does. Adam sees her and says, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be woman because she's taken out of man. One writer says, Man's first, this is man's first recorded speech in the Bible, and it's a cry of ecstatic elation after seeing the woman. Not only is he setting Eve on equal footing, flesh of my flesh, but it means they are now to be formed into a singular people, a kin, their kin. In the book of, going later in Genesis, when Laban sees his nephew Jacob, he says, you're bone of my bone. It's the idea, we are now family. So you have somebody from one completely different family marrying another. When they say, I do, they become one family, starting a new family. In this new covenantal bond, God is going to now utilize Adam and Eve's oneness to carry out their mission in image bearing. They've got a mission in image bearing. It actually holds, there's two things in this mission. We'll read it again, see if you can find it. We already read it. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. See what they are supposed to do together. Listen to what they're supposed to do together. Verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God made man in his own image. Image of God he created, a male and female. He created them and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth. There's two specific obligations in this image bearing mission. Number one, they are to represent God on earth. They are sent as agents, representatives, displaying his personhood to the earth by, number one, having dominion. Dominion means they have been given authority by God over the created realm. God made the earth for them. It's theirs. This is yours. It's kind of crazy. Dominion means royal rule and ownership. In Genesis 2.16, he says they are free to enjoy all they wish, except, of course, one tree. They're free to to enjoy. This is theirs. It's kind of like when they go to Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, they can have all of it, except don't have the everlasting gobstopper. Don't touch that. You'll turn into a blueberry. Don't touch that tree, Adam and Eve. You will turn into something monstrous. But they're allowed to have everything else. So dominion means they're given authority. This is theirs. Second thing is they are to steward. It's interesting in verse 28, it says subdue this earth, chapter 1. Same thing in chapter um, 2. There's this whole idea that they need a helper. Subdue means, you. it doesn't mean dominate in the sense of I get to just wreck it. Subdue means if you don't do anything with it and let it sit, it's going to fall apart. You've got to work it. You've got to bring life out of it. You have to care for it. There needs to be, stewardship is there needs to be intentional care. It's going to take work. I think work before the curse was joyful. Work after the curse is still joyful, but it's harder. So to do this work, Adam needed a helper. That's what Genesis 18, 20 is about. Look how it starts in verse 18. To fulfill the mission of really subduing the earth, the representation, the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. Some people say this is our psychology needed a friend. I think that's partially true, but I think it's also for purpose. I will make him a helper fit for him, somebody to join him in the representation of the image. So out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he'd call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. The man gave names all livestock, the birds of the heavens, every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not. That's supposed to be a sad thing. He, so you can look at it this, Adam, I want you to take care of the world. I'm going to give you somebody to help you. I, I know you can't do it on your own. So here, I'm going to bring some animals. So he saw the cow, you know, brought cattle. Boy, this cow's going to help me. Then the cow just eats. He's of no use. Then he brought the birds. He's naming the birds, and the birds are ready to help. And then they just keep flying away. God, they don't help. And then he brings the beasts. He 
names the lion, the lion bites him on the arm. Get, I don't want him. Gets the monkey, the monkey's throwing bananas at him. Tries to, that's a cat. That cat's of no use. <laughs> and then there was something close. You know, the, dogs, the dog was probably the last one he named. Faithful, true. And then he ate his own throw up and he said, I can't deal with this. And I think God was doing this to build anticipation and appetite. Because then he saw the woman, and after he saw the woman, man has not been the same since. Listen to what he says. And the man said, this at last, at last, this is what I've been waiting for. This at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Perfect fit. And so them together are to have dominion, together they're to steward, and then together they are to beautify. It's interesting how he was allowed, God allowed man to name the animals. <laughs> Participate in fashioning the world the way you want, Adam and Eve. Fashion it the way you want. I'm sure after Eve came along, the knickknacks came along. I, you know, fashion it. Make it beautiful. Adam was fine with just wearing fig leaves, and Eve came and made daisy chains. So make it beautiful. Beautify the world. I want to say something to you if you're single. After hearing this, you may not feel like you are fully complete. Sadly, the church, I think, has portrayed couplehood is the highest goal of every individual. That's not true. Because Jesus was single. Paul was too. And if you are single, you can still fulfill all three of these. And to some degree, Paul makes it seem like, and you don't have the same constraints as married couples do, where you have more freedom to do these things. You still are complete in his image. You're not incomplete. However, there is a second mandate that you can't do on your own, which is the second reason God brought Adam and Eve together. Not just to represent, but to reproduce. Be fruitful and multiply. Human reproduction is the way God designed his image to be spread among this earth. But he designed it to be done only under the marital covenant, to be protected under the marital covenant. The man and woman together will accomplish it in three ways. Number one, they will form this legacy that God once formed through Adam and Eve. God loves people, and he wants them to be in his family. And the only way it's accomplished is when, number one, a man must have sex with a woman. That's the point. That's why they're made different. So, what, what can we say about that? God, ID, he, he designed the idea of sex. It's not bad. It's a good thing. Oh, don't say that word. Why not? He designed it. Secondly, you do need a male and female to accomplish this. Did you know that? God wants godly children, and he wants them raised by both a mom and a dad as well. That's his design. So he says, be fruitful and multiply because he loves children. Psalm 127, 3 to 5 says children are a heritage an inheritance, a gift of the Lord. What if a couple cannot have children? This may be the hardest question to answer of all. I wish I had more time on this, but this is one of the hardest pains for a lot of couples. Here's a harder question. If you're married, why don't you want children? Just a question. Second reason he designed it is for pleasure. He did design it for pleasure. God wants to spread joy, and the union of man and woman was very good in Genesis 1.31. Genesis 2.25 says that the man and his wife were naked. They weren't ashamed. They enjoyed each other in vulnerability and protection under that covenant promise. They had trust, they had intimacy, and they had oneness. That's the point of sex to bring people more together. 
physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And sex carries the gift of pleasure. Just read Song of Solomon, chapter 7. It starts off like this. The song, chapter 7 begins. How beautiful are your feet in sandals, O noble daughter. And I don't want to continue the rest. It's not appropriate right now. <laughs> sex is a very powerful thing. And it is only safe in the context of a promise, a covenant of love. Hebrews 13.4 says the marriage med must be kept pure. And the problem with our culture is they don't believe this anymore. They started listening to a guy by the name of Freud. And then you get to the philosophers of the 60s that champion free love. And sex has now taken the status of something to worship. It's almost like sex was to create oneness. Now we've taken that out and now sex is all that matters. One philosopher... William Reich has even said the core of happiness in life is sexual happiness. But if you study the research on the subject, sex outside of marriage will eventually not only lose its joy, but it will result in the death of the soul. It will rip you to pieces if it's taken outside of its proper design. One writer says the hookup culture is unraveling the social fabric. It produces isolated, alienated adults who come together temporarily for physiological release by repeatedly breaking up or never connecting in the first place. Many people fail to learn how to form strong, resilient bonds needed to create happy, fulfilling, long-term relationships, marriages, and family. That's the truth of sex. Outside of marriage, it can't fulfill. But in marriage, it establishes oneness and it gets better. That's the design. And children and multiplying and being fruitful and multiplies for the purpose of bringing more glory to God. He wants to fill the whole earth with his image. The Hebrew word for fill has the idea of completion. There's a completing of the will of his will that the married couple is fulfilling. Romans said God has a specific number of people he is determined, and then when they're brought in to his family, his will will be complete. So the husband and wife must fulfill that duty. So to sum up, we are made to reflect God by having the man and woman being one in every way as a unified, one, together couple. They are to represent God by being really dominion, subduing the earth but they are to reproduce, be fruitful and multiply. That is the design for man and woman. It is not something that is meant to be fluid. Do as you wish, experiment, try some new design. We are talking about filling the earth with more and more image bearers, priceless beings who are the apex of his creative genius. And if we don't do it right, the damage is horrible. But what if, what if people no longer care about purpose and design? What if people purposely want to wreck it? How should I respond when the design is either discounted? Oh, don't worry about a man and a woman. Just limit it to that. You can have a man and a man, a man and a trans, a man and a woman, a woman and a woman. A non-binary to a non-binary to a non-binary, maybe an animal, throw one of those in there. Do whatever you want. What do you do when people discount it? What do you do when people deconstruct it? Who are you to say that a man must only have feelings for a woman, or a woman can't love whoever they want? Why can't I have feelings for everybody? What if I want to love anybody and everybody I want? It's deconstruction, taking it, destroying what it was intended to be, or... What if it's destroyed? What if I had enough of this marital agreement? What if I want to be single, do it alone, start over again? What if the person I love wants out? What if I have a relative who's gender fluid? What if someone I love is contemplating a divorce? What should be done? Many of you know what I am asking because you are passing through these waters right now and it's killing you. I know what it's like because I'm going through these waters with my oldest daughter right now. 
I have a position that's public, and people know that pastor is supposed to be a minister of righteousness. Keep a strong iron fist. And my daughter's marriage is troubled. What do we need? We need your prayers. Everybody needs, if you go into families, families are hurting. It's interesting when you read the book of James and it says, you know, somebody can commit adultery or somebody can do this thing, but if you sin in one part, you're guilty for all of it. And we tend to judge based on what we think is a more guilty sin. It's dangerous. Some of you are wondering if anything's been done with my daughter because I'm a pastor. Am I just sweeping it under the rug? Is the church ignoring the seriousness of a marital covenant? Are the leaders involved? Are they letting it go because I'm the pastor? I want to assure you our leadership has been very diligent, very caring, very honest. And personally, my personal conviction is I still teach in our home the importance of not destroying God's design for marriage. So what does love do when people break the mold? What does love do when people break the mold? Does love ignore the mold, the design? Because we just start to love and understand. We just toss it away and just say, hey, start over. Let's get Frank Gehry in here to design God's new thing. Should we just abandon the design and allow for new creative models of humanity? Is that, our, is that what we should do? Here's what love does. Love follows 2 Timothy 2. This is such a crucial verse for all of us. 2 Timothy 2, and watch how Paul writes it. I'll just read it and make a quick comment. 2 Timothy 2, starting in verse 24. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, with gentleness, not defensiveness, not anger, not judgment. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do their will. We should never move the goalpost just because we don't think we can make the field goal. Keep it right there. Marriage is a covenant of love till death do us part. We can't stop teaching that. Marriage between a man and a woman for life is God's channel for blessing, joy, joy, fulfillment, and the ability to complete the mission, which is being image bearers. Design matters. 